In the last video, I discussed the concept of background genetics. In this video, I'm going to talk about selective breeding. Welcome to the Art of Breeding with Brian Reeder. I want to stress that with the, uh, the concept of background genes, this does not just apply to species. It may be strongest in species, but it's not going to be in species alone. A phenomena that any breeder of domestic animals or plants will have seen is that, and probably more so in animals than plants, because plant people don't have such a push toward homozygosity as as animal breeders do. Animal breeders tend to create breeds and then they true breed and they want to line breed for a long time in those animals and not outcross them to other breeds or other forms, other types. And in doing that, what sometimes happens is that you get a breed or a strain, a, a line within a breed that's isolated from other breeds or strains for a, a long time, decades, centuries, maybe even, and they don't get outcrossed to other things. No new blood is coming in, and so they're gradually accruing these same background genetic changes that make them a little different from other populations maybe of the same breed or other populations of other breeds. Any breeder who has uh, made crosses will have seen an instance where, let's say in daylilies, you've got these beautiful teeth on the edges of the petals and you outcross it to uh, another fancy daylily that's of the same similar a similar gene pool and so maybe you see some teeth or you see partial expression of teeth maybe that plant was carrying you know the one you crossed it out to without the teeth was carrying a recessive major gene for teeth and that but that came back out to some extent but it can also just be that this was a plant that had some of the right background genes because in my experience when you cross a plant with the teeth on the edges of the petals to a, a species or a near species plant, the teeth vanish and it is a recessive gene. Yet I hear people in the daylily world say, but teeth are dominant. Well, they're dominant if you cross them to some, cross them with something recessive because it's not that they're dominant, but you saw it reemerge in the F1 in the, in the offspring because your non tooth plant was also carrying the tooth genes or carried enough of the background genetics to allow the tooth gene to express. But when you take that out to something like the species or very early hybrids or near species hybrids, the background genetics are not correct. And so you have a recessive gene, it vanishes, there's no supporting genes to let that show up at all. And so you see something that basically has the smooth edge, just like the species parent. And this is a type of selective breeding. And I want to give these kind of, uh, kind of examples to really um, point out and stress how these background genes make a difference in addition to the um, known major genes that are making up a phenotype. It's not just the known major genes. Uh, this, this whole notion of selective breeding, I also want to present this in a way that's useful to people who are in the early stages of domestication or people who have made like wider outcrosses. Let's say uh, you are doing hybrid snakes and you are taking corn snake to king snake, corn snake to milk snake. You're wanting to bring in the red color from the milk snake and maybe bands from the corn from the milk snake and or banded California king snakes. And you want to make something that looks and behaves like a corn snake, but it's got the red coloring and or bands. Well, you're going to take the F1 offspring and breed them together. That's the first way you do it. And preferably, you're going to have made more than one cross so that you're not doing full siblings. You know, if you've got two or three different um, milk snakes and, and, and king snakes and two or three different corn snakes that you can make the initial crosses with that give you a broader genetic base and gene pool, then you don't have to breed full siblings. But even if you're, you've just got full siblings, you can still use them as a test mating to see how things are going to work. But you may then want to almost immediately outcross again so that you don't bottleneck your lines. And I'm saying this because one of the problems we see in a lot of different situations is that the breeders make these crosses and then they want to breed brother to sister to set it because they just wanted to make one cross. They didn't want to make a wide gene pool. And selective breeding should be based on a strong base because you don't hang curtains 
when all you've got is a foundation. You need to build your whole house. So if you're going to start selecting for these phenotypes, like the red color from the milk snake and the bands from the milk snake and the king snake, then you want to try to, to establish this on a strong enough base that you can then inbreed later to set these genes, but also not ruin your line and make them inviable by bottlenecking them genetically and bringing out a lot of de deleterious recessives. That's called inbreeding depression. Um, what you would do is your F1 you cross together, and you make an F2, and in the F2, you select the ones with the most red color and the most obvious bands. But then as they mature, you start looking for corn snake behaviors. Which ones then also are the most corn snake-like? You can take those that are the most red and the most banding, even if they don't have all the corn snake traits, and take them back to the corn snake. While at the same time, then you breed them together, the F2, and make an F3. So then you've got something where you're going back to corn snake, and you're picking up more of the corn snake behavioral genes, because at this point you're starting to figure out if you're going to be able to get back to the red color and the banding. And then on the other side, you've picked the ones with the best red banding and the best, or the best banding and the best red color, and the most corn snake-like behaviors, which may not be all of them, but as many as you could get, and then you breed them together and you select for more of that. Then you take, you know, from this line over here where you went back to corn snake and from this line where you made an F3 and you blend them. This is selective breeding. This is how you keep a lot of genes that you want and select for those genes in these later generation to create these later generation hybrids and bring them into being a breed that's your own idea and then you stabilize them you know hybrid stabilization is where you get them to where you get the genes homozygous and the problem of course can be that you'll have these different background genes working against each other so you're going to want as many of the background genes for the the color and the banding as you can get. You're going to want as many of the background genes for the behaviors as you can get, as well as the major genes that make these traits. So it's really important if you're not wanting to bottleneck them and basically run them into the ground to kind of have two or three or four lines going. You've got a line that you're going to focus more on temperament. You've got a line that you're going to focus more on banding. You've got a line that you're going to focus more on the red color. And eventually, two, three, four, six, 10 generations down the line, you start blending those together. And so selective breeding to me is an act of braiding lines. Once you braid those all together and you've got this specific thing that's come out that's got all the traits you want combined, well, at that point, you may have enough genetic diversity that you can just breed that line. But if you're lucky, you'll have some different branches of that line that you can mix together, even though they all now look and behave kind of the way you want them. Maybe you've got a line that's 1 16th corn snake, and maybe you've got another line that's uh, 1 64th corn snake, and maybe you've got another line that's an 8th corn snake, you know, and then whatever combination of, of milk snake and or king snake. So you want to braid things and and once you braid these lines together then you get to a point where everything's together in a way you want it that it looks the way and behaves the way you want but you still try to have family lines so that you're not just breeding sibling to sibling generation after generation until you know they're all their own great grandfathers and you've just got a big genetic mess now where you can inbreed is if you will test mate and you can establish that a line does not carry a bunch of deleterious recessive genes you can probably inbreed for a while and if you've got good strong genes you can inbreed and intensify those positive genes the strongest lineages with the best traits are made from inbreeding and the worst lineages with the worst traits are made from inbreeding. The difference is intelligent, informed inbreeding as opposed to sloppy, messy, lazy inbreeding where you didn't take all the steps and you didn't do your test matings and you wind up with a mess and then you're trying to put those out on the market. And this applies to everyone, daylily people, snake people, chicken people, fish, whatever you're breeding, horses, dogs, whatever it is. This applies to everything you would try to breed. So it's really important to remember that going from hybrids, going from crosses of breeds, going from crosses of different strains, you're going to run into this problem of different background genes. 
and you're going to run into a situation where you have to select the major genes back the way that you want them, but you also are going to be selecting the minor genes, the background back the way you want them. And I have seen instances in, in chickens where you would think, oh, it's all just chickens. They're all, you know, chickens. You can breed them all together. But I've seen instances where, like, birds that are uh, Sara- uh, not Sarama, well, in them too, but Sumatra and Sumatra-derived do not always produce 100% fertility when crossed to something like a cochin or to something like um, a wine dot. Then you see even some of the situations where you don't see perfect fertility in their offspring. Or you see even some weird things cropping up that you know are like mild chromosomal misalignments where the background genes aren't linking up properly. And that's because maybe the Sumatras have all been way separate for Maybe not 100 years, maybe not 200 years, maybe 500, maybe 800. And they're not being crossed into other stuff often, and stuff's not being crossed into them often. And so there's been a little bit of a genetic drift that's made them have a different set of background genes that are dissimilar enough that there's a little wonkiness. Now, not the kind of wonkiness you would see from, like, crossing jungle fowl, but just a little, enough that I could notice it and see that there was a little weirdness there. And that's just one example. So, like, for instance, in a in a less extreme example, say you've got dark Brahma and black Cochin, and they've been separate for 150 years, and one's been selected for tighter feather, and one's been selected for looser, fluffier feather. Well, it'll take you a few generations to break the, through those background genes. Let's say you wanted to make the silver penciled Cochin. So it has to look like the black Cochin, but it has to be the color of the dark Brahma. So you only want the coloring genes from the dark Brahma, and you want the phenotype form genes from the Cochin. Now, they're very close. They they derive from the same basic stock 150 years ago, so they're going to be very similar. But and the big difference is going to mainly be, of course, the comb, and then the level of fluff and the amount of foot feathering. So the problems you're going to see there in the first two, three maybe even four generations, is that you're going to have to get all your background genes lined up. So it's not that you can't get back to the phenotype, it's just that it takes you a little longer than Mendelian genetics and real simple, straightforward genetics textbooks would lead you to believe. If you go by, there's three leg feathering genes and two fluff genes, and the Brahma already has... um, one of the leg, two of the leg feathering genes and one of the fluff genes, then you're only trying to add two major genes. So that shouldn't be too hard to do, right? But it's a little harder than it seems because you're also selecting for the, these background genes. And so instead of just trying to add two genes, you're adding two genes plus the modifiers, plus the background genetics. And that may take you two or three generations or more to pull off. These are just a few examples um, I wanted to kind of talk about at this point, selective breeding, while we're still talking about hybrids um, and domestication, so that we can sort of understand early on what this process is and what it entails. We'll come back to this a lot. This will be a major focus in almost everything we talk about going forward. Thank you for visiting my channel. I hope this video was interesting to you. If you would like to know more about this subject, leave a comment or question below in the comments section. Please leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell notification to be alerted when new videos post. You can find my poultry books on Amazon at the link below in the show notes. My daylily website, sundragondaylilies.com, offers information on booking me for consultations on your specific genetics questions or mentoring for your breeding projects. It also lists all of my daylily introductions, the cultivars that are currently available, and links to my blog where you can find the bulk of my daylily writing. Thank you for joining me for this video, and I hope you'll be back for more. Have a great day.